Hello, I'm Alexis Wright, and welcome to episode two of Signposts, Stories for Our Fragile Times, a new web series presented by the State Library of Victoria and the University of Melbourne's Faculty of Arts. I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I am on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge them and traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. My guest today is Peter Carey, without doubt, one of Australia's most beloved, not to mention prolific writers. He is the author of Oscar and Lucinda, The True History of the Kelly Gang, Iliwaka, The Tax Inspector, The Unusual Life of Tristan Smith, Jack Meggs, Bliss, My Life as a Fake, Theft, A Love Story, The Chemistry of Tears, and most recently, A Long Way From Home. He is one of only five authors to have been awarded the Booker Prize twice and is a three-time recipient of the Miles Franklin Award. Born in Bacchus Marsh here in Victoria, Peter is joining me today all the way from New York, where he lives, writes and teaches. Peter, thank you so much for joining me for a conversation on signposts. Great, lovely to be here. Nice to see you. And nice to see you too. The series is designed to give writers a chance to reflect on the times uh, we live in times of global warming, or a global pandemic now um, from COVID-19. Major concerns of race inequality in the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations uh, across many countries in the world. We've all heard the terrible news in uh, New York during the pandemic and the more recent Black Lives Matter protests after the killing of George Floyd. How do you see this time in, you know, living in New York and... Uh, and some of the experiences uh, you might have had. It's like living in the middle of a whirlpool and then somebody says, what's happening? What do you see? What do you see a whirlpool? And, and that's, uh, so the, the time we, we're in now, I think is the sort of time that I imagined as a young writer, things like this anyway, my short stories were always about there. So the collapse of societies, the inequities of societies and um, a society where the fat who, who, were, who were once rich and now, and now, victimized by the state and so on so this feel the time we're in now feels like the sort of things i was terrified and imagined when i was in my 20s and 30s yeah, yeah. and now it's here i don't know what to say about it except it's here and every the, the weirdness of the city right at this moment is uh, for instance you know i mean one feels that the police are totally out of control if there's a riot it's a police riot not not a protest of riot Mm. And all over the city, just in the last few weeks, in some neighbourhoods, particularly neighbourhoods inhabited by black and brown people, there have been awful fireworks all through the night, like like, you know, like sort of military-grade fireworks, not the sort of things anyone could afford to buy, and the sort of things that start at 11 at night and go to 5 in the morning. So this, it's just terrifying, and it's unreal, and as for conclusions about it, I don't know. Mm. In the whirlpool. It must have been, you know, quite frightening too. And you know, it, it were you know, were terrible deaths. And um, during the pandemic, mm. uh, uh, you know, every day, you know, you hear yeah. the news that yeah. hundreds died overnight. And I know. And we, we found ourselves at noon every day turning on the television to watch Andrew Cuomo, the governor of the state. Mm. And he would never be my favourite person. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you're frightened, you really do want somebody to you take comfort from somebody seeming to be calm and knowing what they're doing and he mm. provided that for a lot of us then now i'm a little ashamed ashamed of myself good luck with living in new york at the moment <laughs> we're going to talk about your last novel a long way from home i really like your novel it's um I, i've read it and um this is it for everybody <laughs> thank you <laughs> and um it's a great novel and um and I really like the way you, you know, you move along, and particularly the first part. Is it Reddix? Reddix trial? Reddix, yeah. 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 And uh, I don't remember it as a small child, you know, in, in Cloncurry. It was a, a Holden dealer just down the street. So they must have come there. It definitely did, yes. <laughs> you know, there's, there's so much beautiful writing in this book. And um, Charlie Hobbs, young boy in yeah. the school. And... Um, 
and he's uh, one of the students in, in this uh, school here at Quamby Downs. And right here, Charlie had come to the station with his father who had been employed on the company's other property. The story he brought into our classroom was like a leaf that had blown hundreds of miles from its source at Victoria Downs, where Charlie's family were descendants of survivors of the massacre. He was one of those of whom Carter said, it gives no trouble. His voice was as quiet as moth wings, and I could not hear a single word he said when he tells the story about, uh, great story about Cap how Captain Cook came from Big England and what he did here. So oh, that's, a, that's a stolen story. <laughs> I just love the, the quiet as moth wings and um, it's just uh, it's <laughs> lovely. Mm. Well, I got into all of this because um, I grew up in a, in, in a General Motors dealership in the town of Bacchus Marsh. And, um, and the thing I remembered from my childhood very happily was the night that the Red X cars came through the town. And it was magical. And in my memory, it was the middle of the night. It was probably nine o'clock at night. I don't know. I was a kid. Um, and so when, when I finished the last book, I was sort of thinking about what I might engage with. And I was just doodling around and I remembered this. And then I went online and found there were all, there was all this, this newsreel footage from the 50s of the Red X trial. Yeah. And that was sort of exciting because all the things that you think have lost forever were there, you know, and, and mm. not lost. And uh, then I, as, as the cars got up into the top end, I started to watch them plowing, you know, through the country. And a couple of things, the cutaway shots were normally of animals, a goat or sheep or something like that. There was not, not, not really any acknowledgement of the indigenous people who were living there, there and then. And also I thought looking at it, you guys, really don't know where you are. You don't know what you're driving through. And when I'm saying they, but I, you know, I include myself as a you know, privileged white child who wouldn't have known any of those things either or thought about them. And then I thought, well, maybe what we're really talking about is two sets of maps. You know, there's a white fellow map, mm. and a black fellow map, and the, the, the white characters uh, I thought maybe there's a way of, you know, white characters sort of having having some sense of where they really are and what they can't see and what they don't understand. And, of course, that's terrifying for a white fellow because how can I possibly do that in a way that's respectful, accurate, enough? Mm. And I didn't think it was my business to do it, but on the other hand, I'm a white Australian. And... So how can I live my whole life and never once address the single most important issue in the country? And so I thought, well, I have to do this. And if, if I fail and if I disgrace myself, or well, maybe that's just a small price. It's a very small risk compared with everything else that's on the table. Mm -hmm. And so I had to set off to create a car dealership like the one I grew up in. But of course, I was a kid, so I really didn't know how those things really worked. And, uh, and I invented some characters and I, invent, I, I, I invented uh, Irene Bobbs, who's, who's going to drive the car. That's going to be a wonderful driver. And, and then this guy, Willie Barkhooper, who's concerned for most of his life that he's, he's German. People won't like him because he's German. He doesn't really belong in Australia. He belongs at, on, you know, somewhere in that map of Germany was where he really should have been. He's fair haired. He's separated from his wife. He's teaching in Bacchus Marsh, and um, and he doesn't really know it. But uh, he's part Aboriginal and has been adopted, stolen, given to a white family. So he's culturally totally white, but he's inheritance of his body and soul is Aboriginal. He's got a lot to learn and he doesn't necessarily want to be Aboriginal, I don't think. No, well, it's a, it's a hard journey for him, um, particularly at Quamby Downs, which is where his traditional homeland is. Mm. And uh, uh, 
you did a lot of work. You 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 went to the Kimberleys and uh, and you did some work with um, some Aboriginal people up there and yeah. yeah. So um, and, and also uh, when the the weird thing is I I, I arrived in. Fitzroy Crossing, I was in Broome and Fitzroy Crossing. Mm. And on the Easter morning in Fitzroy Crossing, I got really, really sick. So I spent, I spent most of my time in the Kimberley sick in bed. <laughs> All of, and we, we were going to go out to also onto the Malabar and, and, and sleep out with some old fellows who were yes. going to give us some nice lizard to eat and make sure we didn't get bitten by too many ants. We might have got better. I might have got better, you right. <laughs> but I couldn't, anyway. So I did a lot of work on the telephone, and, you know, talking to people on the telephone and talking to, and reading, of course, and writing. Uh, and well, you know how obsessive we get. You, I, I've never s seen you work, or, but I'm sure you're- you, I'm very you obsessive. Obsessive tendencies. And, and so when you're onto something, you're onto something. And so I spent day and night uh, mm. inquiring and talking. Mm. and. At the end, uh, had people read the manuscript. Not always literary people, of course. You know, uh, got my got some of my dialogue fixed up for me, which I was yes. grateful for. Yes. Well, one one uh, particular person uh, from western Western Australia who lives up in the Kimberleys, I think. Oh, uh, Steve Canaan. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, he was so generous. Yeah. And he's a very he, he, great writer uh, himself. Mm. Yes, he's a very good writer. So for one writer to give that degree of time and care to another writer, it's a big gift because we're very yeah. careful with how we use our time. He wrote at length to me about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very, very, very grateful. The thing that, the, the weird thing that came out of that particular exchange was that I'd been erratic about how I spelt Aboriginal, whether it was with a lowercase or an uppercase. <laughs> and I'll never do that again. <laughs> no, no, he will fix that. You know, the last few lines of, of, of the book are just great. You know, where, um, you know, our mother country is a foreign land whose language we have not learnt, earned the right to speak. It's, it's a wonderful novel. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Peter, I was just, uh, I think you're talking a little bit about the creative process uh, and finding stories. I mean, I just thought if you had any thoughts uh, on the future of literature and uh, what it can do and what it can't do in these times mm. and the times ahead, any advice you would give to young writers in Australia or anywhere else? Well, you know, for the young writers, one always says, read, 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 read and read some more. And uh, mm. that's the, the, the best the best teachers in the world are silent in books and, and uh, maybe don't watch. I mean, there's some really good television, and, but the grammar of film and television isn't the same as the grammar of literature. And I think watching a lot of, watching a lot of film and TV sets bad habits sometimes for young writers because they're thinking in the way a film's made, not necessarily in the way literature's made. Uh, but I can't stop anyone watching television, of course. And, I watch it myself. Yes. Um, the thing about I think the thing about the future. Have you ever been silly enough to to to, to judge a uh, short story contest for a newspaper or something like that? I did it once. No, I I, I don't like to be a judge, and um, uh, and I often say that you know I don't feel I, I'm capable of judging someone else's work, mm -hmm. and that's my my, my way out. Uh, I, but, I I I, I, I kind of. Yeah, I, I appreciate that it, it takes a lot of energy to write. And uh, uh, so I appreciate but, that. Whatever, whatever the writing is, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the th what had happened to me, um, I was in, living in Sydney at the time and these, these you know, cardboard boxes, like wine box sort of size, started yeah. arriving in my front door. You know, and there were so many so many people out there writing on their kitchen tables or wherever they were writing. And the thing you, when you start to look at the need, the need for story and how we need that thing, you, it doesn't matter what anybody says about novels being dead or alive or whatever, people are writing and people need to tell stories and it makes sense of life through telling stories. So I don't think there's any concern that we're, we're gonna stop doing that. Uh, and I think that's maybe, an important thing to remember, even when uh, 
you know, Amazon is sort of destroying independent bookstores all over the world. And it's harder and harder to make a living writing, which we, we never thought we would anyway. So I, I, I suppose that's all right. To young writers, I also say, yeah, it's really, well, maybe I'm just talking about myself, but, I, but I, it's something I've observed in, in, in a thought about teaching mm. is that people who tend to end up as writers are not necessarily very good at looking at the world. They're good at how, how they feel. And so it doesn't come natural, naturally to most of them mm. to see a character or to see physical space and to understand how to do that. And low, of course, you can write very, people do write brilliantly without seeing character and without seeing place. If you know how to do it and don't do it, then that's a choice. But if you don't know how to do it, then that's a limitation. So I think that's something to think about. And I think that maybe I don't do it anymore. So that's my loss, I guess. But I always carried a notebook and I was always making notes and I was always trying to see what was in front of me. Uh, and it's, I think the notebook's not a bad practice for, you, for, a young, for a young writer. Thank you very much, Peter. That was just, just wonderful. We could talk for ages and it's, so it's special tonight. Uh, to be uh, listening to you and I really Thanks do thank you. It's great to talk to you. Um, Peter is now reading from the first chapter of A Long Way From Home and he will also read the first chapter of the true history of the Cali Gang. I think whenever we read aloud we really destroy our books because the book's really made for the reader to imagine the voice in their head yeah. and, and because this particular voice is a woman's voice I'm destroying it immediately by sitting here and reading it. Anyway, this is the beginning of the book and it's a female voice. For a girl to defeat one father is a challenge, but there were two fathers standing between me and what I wanted, which was not to fiddle faddle, a lovely little fellow named Titch Bobs. The first father was my own. When he discovered that I, his teeny Irene, his little mouse, his petite size mademoiselle had all by herself proposed matrimony to a man of five foot three, he spat his Wheaties in his plate. Titch's father was number two. He came out of the gate at a gallop, 100% in favour. I was a beauty, a bobby dazzler, until in the hallway by the coat stand, he gave me cause to slap his face. My sister was older and, as they say, more experienced. She could not see why I would want so small a husband. Did I plan to breed a team of mice? Ha, bloody ha. Beverly was five foot two and a half and always breaking off engagements to lanky lurch or gigantic Dino or the famous football player whose name I am not ignorant enough to mention. I would have been afraid to shake his hand, forget the other business. Beverly made her bed and got what you might expect, i.e. 30 hour labors, and heads as big as pumpkins. My own children were as tiny and perfect as their daddy, ideal in their proportions, in the lovely coordination of their limbs, in the pink aptly cheeks they inherited from Titch, and the smile they got from me. My sister could not abide my happiness. She would spend years looking for evidence that it was fake. When her first husband ran away to New Zealand, she wrote me a spiteful letter saying I was never interested in I was more interested in my husband than in my kiddies. She said her boys were everything to her. She knew, she wrote, I only married Titch because of the money I would get from him. She was upset, of course. Why wouldn't she be? She'd married a bastard. She was divorced without a penny, so she claimed. So could she, could she please go and live in the childhood home we had both inherited and whose sale she had always managed to impede? Could Titch and I have used the money? She didn't ask. Would it have changed our lives? Of course. I agreed on a peppercorn rent and kept my feelings to myself. Beverly liked to say that I was willful, which was an idea she got from mum. But mum liked me being willful. She got a real kick from seeing how I got my way. Of course, she was a bit the same, mum, and she was blessed with such neat, level teeth and cheekbones. You would do anything to see her smile, even if you had to buy her a washing machine to make her do it. 
She was the one who got Dad to purchase the Ford, which was what brought Titch to our door in Geelong, Victoria. It was Victory in Europe Day, May the 8th, 1945. No one will ever know how Mum planned to utilise the Ford, drive down to Colac and see her sister after church. That was one story not even Dad could swallow. Anyway, it didn't matter. He went on and wrote the cheque for the salesman, Dan Bobst who, as I discovered when I opened the front door on VE Day, had thrown in free driving lessons which would be supplied by his sonny. No, oh, Lord, what a sight that sonny was, there on our front porch with his cardboard suitcase on a Tuesday morning. I learned he was to stay with us. Poor mum. Alas, she never got to put the key in the ignition and everyone was so upset and busy with the funeral, no one told the young man that he should leave. He had nowhere else to stay, so he unpacked his cardboard case and awaited instructions, as he later liked to say. The Ford was parked in our drive with no sign that it was now part of the deceased estate. My mum was in the Mount Dunedin Cemetery, and the new boarder was the one who helped me go through her things. He said nothing about the car or about the lessons he had been expecting to give to the deceased. He asked me if I knew how to drive. I told him that if he could be home by six at night, he could have tea with us. In the midst of all the sadness, the pretty red-cheeked man was a great comfort I could not do without. I held my breath. I cooked for him and he scraped his plate clean and helped with the drying up. He was neat. When I cried, he comforted me. He left talcum powder on the bathroom floor. In the nights at Western Beach, where you could hear the forlorn anchor chains of the old warships anchored in Carayo Bay, he told me stories of his father, which he thought were funny. These were more important than I knew. In any case, my eyes stung hot to hear that the lovely boy had broken his arm swinging the propeller of the wretched father's monoplane and that the old bully had taught him to land by sitting behind him in the navigator's seat and thumping his slender back with his fist until he pushed the stick down sufficiently. That he abandoned him to stay with a pair of old Irish bachelors at Bullangarook until they had learned to drive their purchase. The sonny was named Titch, although he was sometimes Zack, which was what they used to call a sixpence, and a Zack was there for half a shilling or half a bob, which was, of course, his father's name. Forget it. He was always Titch. God, Jesus. And it seemed I was put on earth to love your tortured body and your impy, joyous soul. How could I predict, dear Beverly, what sort of life my heart's desire would lead me to? Our dad was still alive on the day I first set eyes on Titch. My babies were not yet born. I couldn't drive a car. We had not yet arrived at the era of Holden versus Ford. There was not even a Red X around Australia reliability trial. Although that, the greatest Australian car race of the century, is the story I will get to in the end. Peter is now reading from the first chapter of True History of the Kelly Gang. This voice is, shouldn't really ever have been a voice in the sense that I'd always... It's clearly a written document. It's a, it's a style that you know, I sort of adopted from, from um, Ned Kelly's own jewelry letter. And, uh, and that was, uh, but I never imagined how I was going to read it out loud. It's unconscious, there's not enough commas. Uh, when everybody, anybody does a recording book, book, they thoughtfully put all the commas back in that I took out. But there you go. Also, Ned Kelly is this big bearded man. But much of the story is a boy, and this is the boy re re recounting their poor life. There was no dam or spring upon our property. Each day I took the cows to water them at Hughes Creek. In a good year, it would have made a pretty picture, but in the drought, the creek were no more than a chain of sandy water holes. They were along this dry river bed that Mr. Murray's heifer calf come calling out my name. I were very hungry when I heard her and knew what I must do. I'd never killed nothing bigger than a rooster, but when I saw the long line of the heifers crop above the blackberries, I knew I could not be afraid of nothing. Her eye were a little wild, but she were a pole hereford and very sleek. I later heard that Mr. Murray had made a great investment on her and poddied her with corn and hay, which must be true, for there was no feed in any of his paddocks, and though he owned 500 acres, his stock was out grazing on the roadsides, finding what nourishment they could. I did not care. 
I'd bail her up and let her down the creek into a thick stand of wattles with a clearing in the centre. She did not like the rope around her neck and she fought and bucked and would have done herself a damage had I not bound her hind legs and tied them to a wattle trunk. She began to bellow terribly. Soon she would trust up like a Christmas chook, but I had no pity, nor did I have a knife. I ran up through the scrub to fetch one from the hut. Inside my mother were occupied trying to plug the space between the slabs with clay and straw, so I took the carving knife from beneath her very nose she didn't even notice. Said she, there's one of Murray's beasts caught down the creek. Oh, I said, you must be mistaken. I can hear it bellowing from here. I said I would attend to it and let her know. Within the year, I would have learned to kill a beast very smart and cleaned and have its hide off and drying in the sun before you could say Jack Robinson. But on this first occasion, I failed to find the artery. I'm sure you know I've spilled human blood, but there was no other choice at that time. I were no more guilty than a soldier in a war. But if there were a law against the murder of a beast, I would plead guilty and you would be correct to put the black cap on your head for I killed my little heifer badly and I'm sorry for it still. By the time she fell, her neck were a sea of laceration. I will never forget the terror in her eyes. And this is how my ma found me, with the poor dead creature at my feet and my hair and shirt soaked with blood and gore. We have beef, I said. We'll feast on her. But my words were bolder than my upset heart, and I were very pleased she relieved me of the bloody knife. I didn't know what next to do, having not the faintest idea of how to butcher the heifer, and yet not wanting the privilege to go elsewhere. My mother took my gory hand and led me across the dusty paddock to the hut. And after tying up the dog, she ministered me with soap and water, saying I was a very bad boy and she was angry with me, etc., etc. But this was for the benefit of the other children who were listening at the door and watching through the chinks between the logs. My ma cleaned me so very gentle with the washer, I knew she must be pleased. Of course, Annie could be relied upon to tell my father what I'd done before he even got the saddle off his horse. He'd been delivering butter to people with English names, a job that always put him out of temper. So when Annie showed him the dead beast, he'd come inside to give me a hiding with his belt and mark on my leg I carry to this day. When it were dark, he took a lantern down by the creek and he skinned and butchered my beast and carried the four quarters back across the paddock, one at a time, and then burned the head and hung the hide and cut out the M.M. brand so none could accuse us of stealing Murray's heifer. He salted down what meat would fit into a barrel and the rest he ordered my mother to cook at once. All through this, Annie would not speak to me. Even Maggie kept her distance. But very late that night, we had a mighty feast of beef and I noticed it were not just my excited brothers who ate their fill. Two days later, I was sent home from school at lunchtime to collect my homework, which I'd forgot again. I found a strange bay mare tethered beneath our peppercorn tree. It had VR embroidered on the saddlecloth in silver, Victoria Regina. I knew it were the police. I entered the hut and my father was sitting in his usual chair, watching a lanky, fair-haired constable spreading out the heifer's hide across our table. Come on, John said Constable Doxy, putting his hand right through the hole where the brand had been. John, we know what's missing here. As you can see, said my father, I slaughtered a cow and made a green hide whip. Ah, you made a whip. Correct, my father said, but did not protest or struggle against any accusation. So be a good fellow, will you, John? Bring me the whip. My father did not say nothing. He did not move. He stared at the constable with puffy eyes. Perhaps you never made a whip at all. Oh, I must have lost it. Must have lost it. I'll bring it up to you as soon as I find it. More likely it was the brand, John. Did you cut out Mr. Murray's brand? No, I made a whip. Did you ever hear of Act 7 and Act 8, George the Fourth, number 29? I don't know. It's law, John. It says that if you duff another fellow's heifer, then you're going to go to adjectival jail and you can bring me any adjectival whip you like. But unless it can fill this hole exactly, John, you're going to be in an adjectival lockup. We don't like Irish thieves in Avonall. I can't bear prison, my father spoke as plainly as a man who don't like Brussels sprouts. Well, that's a shame, said Doxy, as he moved towards him. I'd done it, I said, and I thrust myself forward. I put my hand on Doxy's hard black shoulder belt and he rested his hand upon my arm. 
you're a good boy, Jim, he said. I'm Ned. I done it. The policeman asked my father, is this so? But my father would say nothing. He was like some creature drugged by spiders. I turned back to Doxy, demanding he arrest me, and he laughed, ruffling my hair and smiling, a foolish, sentimental smile. Pack up your things, John, he said to my father. You can bring a blanket and a pannikin and a spoon. I done it, I said. The brand were M.M. Shut up, my father said, his eyes now alive and angry. Shut your gob, go back to school. Thus were father taken from me, handcuffed to the stirrup iron of Doxy's man. Gee, thank you, Peter. Thanks very much. That thank was you. just just wonderful to listen to you. <laughs>